How's everyone doing? Excellent. Yay. Thank you for being your last session for us today. I'm sure you're waiting for your beers right now. Now, we do have a little bit of an issue. Our CEO that's going to be joining us today is running late from a meeting that he had with SageMaker. Um, but that'll be an interesting ML keynote tomorrow that you may want to listen to that he's coming from. So before we get started, and by the way, this CEO will be joining us soon, so don't worry. But before we get started, I want to get a feel for who's in the room. Um, so first question, who is familiar with models like GPT-3? Just raise your hand. OK, pretty much everyone. OK, cool. Who knew about generative AI like seven months ago? Seven months ago. Seven, OK, more than I did. It's new for me. I'm just kidding. Um, next question. How many of you see yourself potentially training a foundational model in the next X years? So raise your hand. Foundational model. OK, cool. Those are the heavy hitters. They're going to be using a lot of GPUs. So last question. Do you see yourself fine-tuning? Fine-tuning. OK. So just say it out loud. Are you going to be fine-tuning an open source model, for example? Something mostly open source. Mostly open source. Anyone fine-tuning something like that's closed sourced out there? OK, cool. All right, it sounds like we've got the right audience. I think everyone knows this space pretty well. So I'll introduce myself. My name is Farshad. I'm part of the business development team that works with customers doing machine learning. Um, I basically help customers build some of our largest distributed training environments and also inference infrastructure. I'm here with Pierre. Yep, uh, my name is Pierre Yves Aquilanti. Um, I'm leading a solution architect arch tech team called uh, Frameworks ML, but typically we actually take care of self-manage uh, ML workloads that run on EKS, batch, parallel cluster, anything that is large, ugly, hairy, and hard to solve. Thanks, Pierre. So the talk today is called How Stable Diffusion Was Built and Tips and Tricks on How to Train Large AI Models. Now, the good thing is that some of you are interested in building foundational models and some of you will be doing fine tuning. A lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today will apply to both. We're probably not going to spend as much time on the inference side, but we'll certainly spend a lot of time on training. Um, and then we'll also uh, go into, well, why don't I just show you the agenda? That'll make things a little bit easier. Um, so here's our agenda. We're going to start with a pop-up quiz about generative AI, just to get the blood flowing. But these questions will have prizes, so I'll give you some, some water bottles for that. Then we're going to go through the recent history of AI and some of the trends that it's causing. When Emod gets here, the CEO, he's going to cover Stability's cluster that was used to train stable diffusion. And he's also going to show you a preview of a lot of, a lot of the new models that he's working on. So that'll be really interesting. But then we'll get to the to kind of the meat of the operation, which is how do you actually build this stuff on AWS, which is what Pierre will be covering. All right, so first pop quiz. And whoever gets this right gets a water baller from me. What is the largest cluster size that has been publicly announced for training? Uh, three, 4,800. That's correct. Can I throw this to you? Is that cool? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's right, ultra cluster. Yeah, we'll touch on that. So good job. So ironically, it's actually from Stability AI, and that number is now past 4,000. Now what's cool is, if Stability wants to, they can use those 4,000 GPUs for one training job, which is not out of the question. We do see customers doing things like that of that scale. All right, so next question. Keep in mind, 2025 is like two years away from now, right? So you're going to see things like new images, videos, probably metaverse stuff, code that writes code. Gartner, according to Gartner, what percentage of all data will be produced by generative AI by 2025? Raise your hand over there. 10%? That's right. And I think you're right. I think it is probably too low. 
Um, and the reason why I think it's too low is because this space is growing really, really fast. And if you kind of get a sneak peek into what it's capable of doing, it's, it's a little bit sometimes uh, scary, to be honest with you, what it's capable of. But it also doesn't just apply to things like you know, images and video and, and in general entertainment. It also applies to things like drug discovery. So Gardner estimates X, X percentage of drug discovery will use Gen AI by 2025. So one more hand over there. 20, would you say 25? It's actually 50%. Yeah. So this new technology is, is going to change a lot of different industries. My, catch, my throws are not that good, so thank you, Pierre. Now, what's been causing this space to kind of grow so fast, right? In the last five years, there's been so much changing in the AI world. And it's really come down to one paper with the most meme-sounding title I've ever heard of in a paper, and that paper is called Attention is All You Need. Doesn't sound technical, but it captures people's attention, right? And this paper introduced a new architecture called the Transformer Architecture, hence the Transformer over there, probably Optimus Prime. Um, and it really add two added two contributions to the ML space. The first thing, it allowed computers um, doing AI to really efficiently use parallel computing, right? So that was huge. The second thing is that introduced the concept of attention, which allowed, in the case of NLP, AI to understand the relationship between words. So if you've heard of things like GPT-3, BERT, and now generative AI like stable diffusion, these are all the results of the transformer architecture. And if you talk to a lot of the thought leaders in the space, what they'll tell you is they don't really see the transformer architecture changing too much in the next five years. And that's also why you see chipset manufacturers, like NVIDIA, for example, implement the transformer engine in their new chipset coming out next year called the H100. Now, if you're curious about the workflow of how this generative AI space and general transformer space goes, it is as follows. Um, so the first thing is transformers require a lot of data, right? Sometimes models. Um, or of just one type of modality, as we call it. So for example, text or images, you take an enormous amount of data and you use that to train your transformer model, also known as foundational model, right? Then what you do, and this is the analogy that Ima told me yesterday over lunch, which I really like, the foundational model is kind of like a high school degree. You get it as like your base level of knowledge, right? But then you want to go and become an expert in a specific use case, like, for example, computer science, or art, or marketing. And that's really what fine-tuning is, right? It's fine-tuning it for a specific use case that allows the model to perform a lot better. One thing that's interesting that I've observed is that if you took a really, really strong foundational model and you didn't fine-tune it for a use case, an OK foundational model can perform better than a really strong, sorry, an OK foundational model with fine tuning for a specific use case can outperform a foundational model. So what that means is that a lot of these open source foundational models that are gonna be released are gonna have a lot of applications that are still gonna be very useful for the world. Another thing to keep in mind is, you know, talking to the VC community, what they'll tell you is that they expect there to be roughly maybe 20 of the companies that build these foundational models, not too many, but you're gonna have probably thousands of companies taking advantage of the fine tuning, right? And finally, you got inference, right? And the inference is gonna be a lot, right? So you got a few of these, a lot of these, and an enormous amount of these, right? Now, this is the AWS ML stack. What I really like about the stack is that we really do try to make it easy for you to use any part of the stack, right? So if you don't want to do much ML, you can use the top of the stack, where, for example, you're just using API calls to interface with AWS. So for example, 
if you want to do computer vision, you can send an image via API to recognition, and I'll tell you what's in the image. Some of these servers, services actually offer fine tuning as well. You can send your data to AWS, and you can train it for your use case. Now, the middle of the pack is SageMaker. Um, I see a lot of customers use SageMaker, and for some reason so far, a lot of the customers that I've worked with in the large language model space or the generative AI space, they tend to actually operate at the bottom of the stack, right? And that's been the case for stability this last year, right? So what does the bottom of the stack really mean? It means that you're using, for example, EC2, you're using, for example, um, storage services like S3, and what you tend to find is that customers that are doing what we call self-managed, what they tend to do is they'll, they'll have pretty consistent architectures that they use, right? So some customers for orchestration may use EKS, some may use um, ECS, um, some customers um, use, for example, Trainium, right? That's gonna be really good for distributed training. And a lot of customers use A100s, which is our P4D instance type. In the case of stability, um, these are the specific services that they use, right? So they use A100s for training, they use S3 for storage, and they also use FSx for Lustre, which is great for distributed training. Um, for their orchestration, they actually use Parallel Cluster, right? So if you, you, if you use Slurm in the past, that's a great service to use. And finally, um, EFA becomes really important in the space of distributed training as well. Now, fun fact about stability is they're actually in the process of testing Trainium 1 and Infringia 2, which was just, I think, announced like an hour ago, right? Now, here are some fun facts about stability. Uh, so first of all, a lot of times people think that stability is training one model at a time, right? Which sometimes is true, right? Sometimes stability will take their 5,000 cluster of GPUs, well, 4,000, but now it's 5,000, um, and they may train one model, like one very, very large model, right? But what they also do is they train 10 models at any given point in time, most of the time. The benefit of doing this is that it can really reduce your spikiness of your workloads and kind of have like a flat usage throughout the year. The benefit of having flat usage is you can use things like savings plans to really bring down the cost of the GPUs slash instances that you're using. Um, has anyone seen Stable Diffusion 2, by the way, the launch of it? Raise your hand. I'm curious, what are, you, what are y'all's thoughts about Stable Diffusion 2? Good so far, but anyone thinks bad so far? You can be honest. Okay, some thumbs down, okay, cool. Yeah, I've been monitoring it as well. I just saw today that Stable Diffusion 2 does allow AI to actually make hands, right? So that's pretty cool. All right, and we got our CEO and his account management team walking in now, perfect timing. You can upload. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Imad. You're up very soon. Now, st Stability uh, just launched Stable Diffusion 2. Was it Friday of last week, I believe? Thursday? Uh, Stable Diffusion 2.0 um, took 200,000 A100 hours to train, right? And I, I could be just guessing here, Imad, but I imagine your future models are going to take more and more over time. We spent about 1.2 million hours doing the open clip model. There you go. 1.2 million hours doing the open clip model. Um, someone hit on Ultra Cluster earlier. I think it was you. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you're building these very, very large clusters, you really want to take advantage of Ultra Cluster and EFA to optimize distributed training. Ultra Cluster basically allows you at a high level to make your giant cluster look like one supercomputer, right? So instead of me talking about stability, I'm going to hand the mic to Imad. Imad, maybe you could do a quick intro, and then the slides are yours. Cheers, buddy. Thanks, man. Hello, everyone. Thank you for staying here and well, not playing blackjack or getting drunk right now after this. Um, hi, I'm Ahmed Mostak. I'm CEO, founder of Stability AI. Um, previous life, I was a hedge fund manager. Then I led the United Nations AI initiative against COVID-19, did AI work to repurpose drugs for autism, and decided, hey, why not make open source AI for everyone so we can always have an augmented future? 
Um, the Stability Platform uh, basically is based around open source, so it's scale and service. So you know, we built communities such as Eleuther, Lion, and others that we're supporting, and we'll spin out into independent foundations uh, on a verticalized basis for language models, code models, image models, protein folding, and other things. Um, we offer APIs and integrations, so you know, just provide it at ridiculous scale, and there's going to be some interesting stuff about that soon. And then we go into the largest companies in the world and build gigantic models. Um, so that's a TBD kind of coming thing. You need to have supercomputers, talent, and data in order to build these models. So from a Lutheran line, we had uh, the Pile, which was one of the most commonly used text language data sets. At Lion, we built uh, Lion 5B. So Lion, previously the largest image data set was about 100 million text image pairs. Lion 5B is 5.6 billion. And the new version is going to be even bigger. Uh, the Pile version 2 will probably be about 2 terabytes of data as well. Uh, on the talent side, we've got our core team, our community, and academic partners. And then finally for scale, we've got Amazon, AWS. Can't get more scale than that. Um, we decided to go very big. Uh, so uh, we started a year ago with two V100s, I think. And uh, as of a couple of months ago, we had 4,000 A100s in one ultra cluster, all same spine optimized to a ridiculous degree by the AWS team. Um, so to put that in context, these are the largest public A100s. Um, I think it's about the 11th fastest public cluster in the world, full stop. Uh, right now, actually, we have about 6,000. So uh, getting up there about Pearl Mutter size. One day we'll catch up with uh, Meta, one day next year. So um, yeah, it's been quite something, really understanding and learning how to use kind of clusters of this size. This is from the State of AI report, which is a fantastic one as well. And I think you know, this is part of the exponential nature of this technology. So the fastest supercomputer in the UK is Cambridge One at 640 A100s. Like the fastest one in Canada is probably Narval at 636. John Zay in France, about 440. So this kind of shows the scale of the exponential nature of what's required to build some of these models. Because even though you know, we trained Stable Diffusion on 256 A100s, we've done training runs up to 1,500 for some of our other models. Um, in particular, next generation AI architectures around image and some of these other things. I think a lot of you are kind of here to hear about Stable Diffusion, uh, Latent Diffusion Plus uh, Plus. Stable Diffusion was a collaboration with Confiz team, uh, University of Heidelberg, Munich, uh, Runway ML, Lion, Eleuther, our own stability team, um, kind of driven and run by Robin Ronback, who's one of the leads on generative AI at Stability, along with Catherine Krauss and Rivers Have Wings. So over the last 18 months, we've been funding the entire open source AI art space and kind of moving from kind of generative models towards these diffusion type models. Originally, it was a generative model that was then glided by, for example, CLIP. So VQ GAN and CLIP was one of the original ones with a GAN. So you had a generative model and then a guidance model, uh, text Im image to text, text, text to image and image to text that bounced back and forth from each other. As the last year progressed, we moved into these kind of diffusion based models instead, where, you know, it kind of works almost as a denoising function. So you start with some noise. Uh, this is what seeds are or image to image. And then kind of you gradually denoise it towards that uh, station distribution to get to the original target prompt. In reality, it just looks a bit like magic. But this is kind of the high level thing. And this has been the real driver of this. Because we got to Stable Diffusion 2 just a short while ago. So Stable Diffusion 1 took 100,000 gigabytes of images. So that was Lion EN, which is about 2 billion images. And created a 2 gigabyte file that could do just about anything. Um, Stable Diffusion 2 we adjusted because with Stable Diffusion 1, we had a image generation model and then a text model. So that was OpenAI's CLIP model that they released um, in January of last year to get this all going. But we didn't know what the data set of CLIP was. So when we had a lot of questions around like artist attribution, around um, not safe for work and the other things, we had no idea what data was in there. So that's why we trained this open CLIP model with Lion, which was about, like I said, 1.2 million A100 hours. So we knew on the image generation and text generation model what happened on either side. So these are some of the examples of generations you can get with Stable Diffusion 2. Um, and we reduced the time of inference of this from about 5.6 seconds on launch to 0.8 seconds at the moment. And tomorrow we have a very big announcement. Uh, don't think I'm allowed to say it here about inference times, which I think will change the game again. These are all raw, unedited outputs as well, which is a bit insane, I think. Who would have thought we'd get to photorealism so quickly? Um, but one of the main things with Stable Diffusion 2 is that we wanted to have a flat architecture, so we did deduping and a whole bunch of other things so that certain things wouldn't be overfit. This allows us to use it as a base for fine-tuning. So someone took, uh, this was, um, 
is it hugging face? So I just run. I will credit properly in a minute. Um, one of the open source researchers from Hugging Face um, created this model, fine-tuned on just 10 images. So you can use the diffusers library that they have to do this in like 10 lines of code, where they fine-tuned it to Mad Max. So you can take your own face, some of you will have seen that, and use um, textual inversion or use Dream Booth or some of these other technologies to really point to various things. In fact, what some people are doing now, because the entire distribution was flattened, so artists like Greg Rutowski and certain celebrities were pushed down in the prominence order, is they're doing embeddings to bring these things back up in the kind of latent space distribution. Because that's what it looks like when you take 100,000 gigabytes of data and compress it down into two gigabytes of knowledge, I suppose. It's kind of these spikes of latent space whereby you understand various things and principles of the nature of, well, Emma Watson-ness which was like 5% of all images generated in our Discord bot when we were doing the beta. Uh, it doesn't do Emma Watson anymore. I don't wonder why that is. Um, so tomorrow we're actually relaunching our Discord bot as well, so we'll see what people do. But I think that's pretty cool, you know, like, look at that. Uh, let's hope that isn't the hellscape. Actually, is that Las Vegas? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Um, we also released a variety of other models, because I don't think the image model is enough. So we released a depth to image model that kind of uh, was based on Midas that allows more accurate kind of image to image. Um, so this allows kind of a transformation by taking a depth map that can then map onto the 3D context because we're moving from 2D to true, true, to true 3D. In fact, uh, in January, we'll be releasing a glasses-free 3D tablet. We have one of the prototypes here, so please don't anyone steal it. Uh, maybe some people can see it later. Because I think the future is seamless 2D, 3D, kind of all this type of generation. And this is one of the things these foundation models have enabled. So GPT, Neo, J, and X were downloaded 25 million times by developers, which I still can't get my head around. Text is one of the hardest ways of communicating after voice. Voice is the easiest when we have a conversation. Communicating through images via this or PowerPoint is incredibly difficult and frustrating, especially PowerPoint. But now we've basically created technology that in a second anyone can create anything, which is kind of insane because it means we can all communicate visually. And soon, real time, 24 frames a second. Announcement soon. Um, we also have in painting because sometimes you want to adjust things. So, you know, we have kind of encoded mask images that kind of then adjust. And we're working on technology to enable kind of prompt to prompt and other things. So you can just describe the changes that you want, and then it'll in paint things to remove people, add people, you know, kind of do all that kind of thing. Um, I think this kind of again gets extended to things like upgrading your child's artwork through text to image because again this is a denoising function whereby you start with initial thing so it can be a seed of random distributions and that allows you to have the constants or you can have an image that then becomes it's a bit creepy Farshad why do you pick these <laughs> you everyone nightmares um, so you know but then it's not enough to just have these models. You need to integrate them into workflows. So we've got uh, plugins for Photoshop, GIMP, and others. Some of them we officially support, like the Photoshop plugin. Other ones, like the Krita plugin, et cetera, we don't. Um, there is an issue in that you know, we had to release Stable Diffusion under a create different type of license, this Creative ML license, which is basically saying, don't use it for unethical stuff. Don't be naughty. Um, because you can use it for anything, and so we had to be a bit careful. Because we don't have an MIT or CC by 4 license with our, like with our other models, it hasn't been able to be integrated fully into Crite and Blender, but in the new year, we are going to be moving to fully open source now that we have mitigations, and so I think you'll see this even explode further. Similarly, Stable Diffusion 2 is largely safe for work, still not fully safe for work. Uh, one of the things is that as we got to photorealism, you can't really have not safe for work and kids, because you can combine the concepts. Um, but this will mean it will be allowed to be used by more and more people because it's pretty safe because we kind of folded in the safety filter and did a whole bunch of things. We did go a bit overboard though. So we kind of, if you look at the Lion data set, you've got a P unsafe kind of score, which is probability of porn. Um, porn really kicks in at 0.99 and above or 0.98. We did 0.1, uh, which I'd like to say was deliberate. It was actually a little bit of an accident. Um, but it also meant that we removed all the humans from the training data set, and we're adding them back in right now. Uh, so stable diffusion one to be really soon. <laughs> Different one to be soon, yeah. Uh, but it's actually also interesting, because with these models, like what is the optimal amount? Uh, a year ago, Catherine Krauss and our lead coder, jeez, it's been a fast time, uh, released CC12M, which is one of the first conditioned models. So it had the generator model and then the text model embedded. It led to DALI2 and other things. Um, that was used as the first basis of Midjourney, where we funded the beta and a bunch of other things. And it could create kind of really good kind of graphics. But obviously now you've moved on dramatically. 
but that only used 12 million images, yet it could create these things. How many images do you need to create these models? We only need 10 to fine tune them now, because it's almost like teaching a high schooler, well, a very precocious kindergartner, I'd say. I think it's gone to grade school now. Um, we're not sure. And so I think understanding how the images interact with the data, so the models interact with the data now, is going to be really interesting, particularly when you talk about data augmentation and other things. So we also trying to make it easy. Dream Studio is a bit crap now. It's our implementation. Uh, Dream Studio Pro is coming out shortly, whereby it's got node-based editing, uh, 3D keyframing, dynamic kind of stuff. And we're really trying to push and experiment how these things are interacted with. Um, so again, we've got kind of 3D classes for 3D displays. We've got new mechanisms of human computer interaction, and we really want to test this out. This is also part of why, those of you familiar with the ecosystem, there's a lot of co Google Colab notebooks, soon to be SageMaker notebooks as well. Um, which we've had communities kind of getting around. So all the lead developers are members of our team. We mostly hire from the community. And it was just great seeing the experimentation around animation, around kind of <clears throat> a bunch of these different things um, that, that enabled. And again, I think this is the thing whereby one of the things we're really trying to do is combine that AI open source and community to create a very differentiated company and soon ecosystem of company and foundations across these modalities in kind of order to do that. The relationship with open source is that, you know, I looked when I was doing the United Nations COVID thing, a lot of companies promised a lot and they didn't come through and I thought this is crap. And I thought about my kids and I'm like, in the future, AI is gonna drive everything from education to healthcare. Does it really make sense that that's gonna be run by one company? No. There's a super powerful technology, like I said, now we can communicate visually as a species with no barrier, just literally in the last year. What's that gonna to lead to? I don't know. But that should be a commons for everyone and it shouldn't be a case of, well, this is too powerful, people not to have the technology. You know, when people say it's too dangerous, I ask them a very simple thing. So you don't want Indians to have this, or Africans. There's no real answer to that, because it's basically a racist statement, right? Because the reality is, again, it's very kind of confined, this technology, yet it's available now. So like I said, with a two gigabyte file, you can run stable diffusion on your iPhone. You know, with a new version of Replit, you can, uh, where you can kind of run it dynamically anywhere. Uh, soon you'll be able to run it incredibly fast as well on a variety of these things. And this is why people are just coding on their MacBook M1s. But we'll make it more and more accessible to everyone. I think this is a big differential as well because a lot of people were thinking about bigger and bigger models. And bigger and bigger models are fine, but now you're seeing the combination of DL and RL to create more customized models. So these are the instruct models. These are kind of a lot of these kind of embedding-based approaches and others. And we thought that smaller, more dynamic models would work a lot better. So we have a 67 billion parameter chinchilla optimal model training at the moment, but we also released, for example, our instruct model series. So you can take these reasonably large models which can still fit on one pod, and then instruct them down to be really optimized for your use case, and then shrink them down. We're also really about to release things around distillation and other model optimization chips, because once they're accessible, it goes out into the community, and the community develops wonderful things. So hundreds of people have developed on stable diffusion. Uh, in fact, like, you know, I think as of today, stable diffusion overtook Ethereum and Bitcoin and GitHub stars in three months, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's much better than Web3, I'll be telling everyone that. <laughs> Distributed AI, that's a new buzzword. Um, and we've seen hundreds of thousands of developers actively using it. Um, hundreds of companies have emerged from it. And it's not even mature. Like, nobody's going to use stable diffusion in two, three months. I know, because we've got much better models that we're going to release. Um, and this is the pace of development. Like, to be honest, I don't think we get to photorealism. I mean, that's crazy, right? It's like, wow. A bit creepy, also crazy. Um, and so yeah, this is kind of the thing whereby when you put it out open source, people use it as part of their building blocks. And like I said, our business model is very simple, whereby we're going to go and take exabytes of the world's content data and turn it into foundation models. And then I'm going to remake Game of Thrones season eight, because it was shit. <laughs> uh, you know, um, we kind of want to be this foundation as well, whereby we've got new data partnerships. So we just got an exclusive license to all the Bollywood data. So we're going to have an AI Rahman model and then movies that are exactly the same. No, wait, uh, very different kind of coming out of that. And we're building national data sets for every country as well as India GPT, Thailand GPT and all these things as well. Because a lot of this is kind of a monoculture whereby you don't have the data available. But I thought Japan Diffusion, for example, was fantastic because they took stable diffusion and retrained the text encoder for Japanese. So salary man didn't mean someone very happy with lots of money, but a very sad person. 
You know, that regional context is only available if you make these models available. And like I said, I think we want to be that kind of platform that provides the generalized models and then kind of makes it accessible, the scale and service. So um, if anyone's going to build an API, you probably shouldn't because we'll probably outcompete you given our plans here. Uh, please use ours or just do it yourself. Uh, it's all good. We're going to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, partnering with ABWS, you know, um, we've kind of been co-building with the SageMaker integration. To give you an example, the SageMaker team worked with us to get GPT-Neo on our language models on the ultra clusters from 103 teraflops per GPU to 163 teraflops per GPU, 52% utilization at 512 A100s. Um, that was pretty amazing uh, given, you know, EFA and kind of all of that. And when I looked forward to kind of the P5Ds and some of the other things, it's going to get very, very interesting on training. Because like I said, we train up to 1,000 A100s, or 1,500 for some of our things. Um, there was the access to compute as well. So, you know, for a 13-month-old company to have 4,000 A100s was a pretty amazing thing. I think that's testament to the scale that AWS has and also, obviously, the foresight to kind of back us. Thank you, Farshad. Uh, appreciate it. And now the GPU overlords. So I have control over more GPUs than anyone. <laughs> I've been trying to tell people that's a new status symbol, yachts and pictures, everything. How many GPUs do you have? That's the question. And then, you know, in partnership with Amazon, this is a broader thing because obviously as AI comes, Amazon itself is an AI consumer. So if you kind of look at studios and a whole bunch of these other things, I think a lot of this intelligence will be pushed out to the edge. So you have a multimodality of these very small models that are optimized. I think we can get stable diffusion down to 200 megabytes, for example, which is, again, is insane. And so you can have edge compute, where I have this vision of an intelligent internet where every single person has um, their own model, every single country culture, and these will be different sizes and they will interact with each other because they are so dynamic. And you can have cross-textual embeddings and things like that as well. So I think that's going to be what you need to communicate and create brand new experiences of all different types, and that's going to be pretty crazy, given that there's probably going to be like $100 billion put into this sector in the next few years. Like, let's face it, self-driving cars got 100 billion, crypto got like 300 billion. They're kind of crap compared to this. I mean, how cool is it? You create anything you can imagine, come on. So, yeah, I think, oh, I pushed the wrong button, haha. <laughs> uh, how you can use stability models today? Uh, you can download them, you can use the API. What's well, stay tuned? Stay tuned is uh, attend the ML keynote, attend the ML keynote tomorrow so you can learn more about some other things happening that oh, we, yeah. we can't announce today. Oh, yeah. There's some very exciting things being announced tomorrow, <laughs> shall we say. Um, I think literally a step change. That's a good way to put it, isn't it? It's going to be fun. Um, so using Stability Today, you know, we've got the Stable Diffusion 2.0, Depth to Image. We actually released the four times upscaler. We're about to release the eight times upscaler. Stable Diffusion 2.1 and a whole variety of other architectures will be there. Uh, we're going to release something very nice for Christmas, in painting and out painting, etc. And we've got an absolutely packed kind of roadmap. So we've got in the next generation language model and kind of text data stack, you know, join a Luther, kind of play with that. Our code generation model, CodeGen, um, join Carpa.ai, our representative learning lab for that. Uh, we just released OpenElm, which is a um, evolutionary code generation algorithm as well. So we're doing a lot of focus on open um, endedness. Also, we released from that lab our Instruct data set, so you can take these large language models and use reinforcement learning to really customize them to your needs to create Instruct models. Uh, we've released Dance Diffusion, which is our audio model, and we're going to release a text condition audio model, so you can describe anything and create any type of music. A or Rahman model will be the first one for the Indians here. That'll be fun. Uh, started training our video models. Those will be really interesting as well, uh, though we might not need them soon, and 3D models. And then we're going to be announcing fine-tuning via the API and lots of API things there. So it's all been very exciting. I'm very tired. Um, but I hope you're all enjoying kind of this and you take it and you build amazing stuff. Like I said, we're going to do full, we are fully multimodal. We do the whole variety of things. Amazon have been an amazing partner. And now, you know, we really hope to make it available to everyone as well as share our knowledge. So we've been writing up usage guides on all of this. You know, we've been contributing to Parallel Cluster and a lot of these other systems as well um, because, you know, we're taking the pain of getting all the edges out so you guys won't have to. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Um, I'm going to do a quick show, show of hands uh, first. Um, so who's more on the application side than, um, let's say, operations or let's say infrastructure? 
few applications. No, not so much, actually. And uh, more on the infrastructure side. Who's managing infrastructure? Who's running jobs? Ah, OK. Um, so let me, um, uh, let me just, so I'm going to discuss, uh, um, t introduce you to uh, the, the architecture that Stability is using to build their models. And um, there are actually quite a few components uh, that they are using. So there is compute, network, and obviously storage. Um, that, um, so these are the key components. So you, obviously, they are the same components for every workload, you can say. But we are actually picking a few specific services, including also on the orchestration layer with parallel cluster and cloud formation. But we are using um, P4D, Trinium um, containers as well, as well as uh, EFA. That means also placing the instances where we want them to be placed uh, in an AZ but also storage components. So I'll go in a bit more details um, in to each of them. The first one is ultra cluster, or what we we'll refer as Amazon EC2 ultra clusters, and the uh, RP4D instances. So you can place up to 4,000 uh, uh, GPUs per uh, cluster, ultra cluster, and those will be the um, uh, aggregated in a tightly coupled fashion, meaning that you'll get full bisection bandwidth through EFA as well as a low, low latency. Typically, that's actually the configuration that you want to run when you have a tightly coupled workload. For example, if you have to scale your model across, um, um, across multiple instances. So if you need to actually go over one instance, like two, four, 16, that's actually what you, um, what you really want to use. So the, um, one property also interesting about parallel, um, so ultra cluster is that we, um, and so we actually are, um, we GA the uh, Trinium. So the difference compared to P4D is that the memory of, um, um, of uh, on one instance can be accessed, so the, actually the memory of all the chips can be ac accessed by one chip. So it's actually, um, uh, so you can actually access the full address space of the memory through the accelerators. Um, the advantage is that you have 512 gigabytes that each accelerator can use because that's actually a global memory. But also you've got an EFA network connectivity um, of 800 gigabits per second. And it, do mat it does matter a lot for transformer-based workloads. Um, we've seen actually some of our customers looking really for those high, um, for high uh, throughputs between instances. But what you, um, what you have to consider also with um, Trinium, that stability um, is also um, uh, testing, if I'm not mistaken, um, you, um, you can actually aggregate many of those chips, up to 30,000 chips, into one, one large cluster. So that gives you the possibility to run not only uh, large models, but also many of them uh, at the same time. But all this actually is allowed um, through um, a network technology that we call Elastic Fabric Adapter. If you're not familiar with it, we launched it in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. or 2018. It was one of my, my first years. And um, what it allows you to do is um, it will actually allow you to, to shortcut uh, the path um, between your application and the hardware. So you're gonna go through LeapFabric. So it's um, an open source library. And you're gonna um, tap directly through using Nickel, for example, or it can be also MPI, uh, directly call the, 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 um, the LeapFabric that's gonna actually access the, the device. So that's actually also what uh, enable you to scale at, uh, on thousands of GPUs without uh, um, being impacted by high latencies and variabilities that you can see, for example, also on, uh, on TCP. Um, if, for example, if you are using ENA or Elastic Network Adapter. The advantage also of um, um, EFA is that we are using a protocol called Scalable Reliable Datagram that would actually spray the packets in out of order across multiple paths within the network, meaning that the, the, um, you, you, you are not blocked by a head of line. For example, the first packet did not arrive, we have to wait for the first packet to be remitted. It's not the case here. But all that actually is, um, so there are a few other components uh, that are important. So let, let me go back to the previous one. It's actually storage. It's a one that is particularly overlooked 
um, I'm actually seeing a lot of challenges from um, customers and the, um, on what actually is the right hierarchy. And the way you can think of, uh, of it is Amazon S3 is going to be your backbone. So you have those three components. So, so your NVMe drives, FSX for Luster, and Amazon S3. So Amazon S3 is your backbone. You'll store your data. That's where you store re your results, maybe checkpoints um, as well. And uh, you will actually make the data transit, for example, between an, um, either through a CLI, it can be, or an SDK, but also through a hierarchical, uh, hierarchy uh, storage manager um, for Luster. It will allow you to actually exchange data between S3 and your FSX for Luster partition. FSX for Luster is your high speed storage. It has single uh, millisecond latency. Um, it's much lower than S3. But also, it's POSIX compatible, meaning that you don't need to transform your application, you don't need to call an SDK to actually access FSX. And the good thing also is that you can actually have, let's say, one petabyte of data in uh, your S3 bucket of an FSX partition, so FSX for Luster um, uh, storage of, let's say, one terabyte. And that's fine, actually. So you can use it as a hot storage and exchange only the data and, and work only on the data that you use. So that allows you actually to create multiple file systems, multiple clusters, but always have the same source. And then the important point also that stability is using is the instant store. If you're not familiar with it, that's actually, these are actually the NVMe drives that are attached physically to the, to the instance, to the servers. And uh, I'll explain how, but they are rated in a RAID 0, so that it's a fat disk that does appear as a fat disk, but actually composed of multiple smaller NVMe drives of one terabyte each. And you can use that for checkpointing or like are you heavy transactions during compute, for example, to output the weights. Um, and Stability actually uses all those three components for compute at the instant store, data, um, for example, store input, output checkpoints uh, on FSX for Luster, and Amazon S3 as, an, uh, um, as a storage backbone. And all that, I'd say, can be quite complex, actually, to build if you were to, to create your own infrastructure, you know, whether it is through cloud formation or you know, the CLI, I've seen some people do that. And in fact, um, Stability, like uh, other uh, customers in this space, are using parallel cluster. So, quick question, who's familiar with parallel cluster? Just two, three, three people? Seriously? <laughs> okay, one more, okay, thanks Tyler. So Parallel Cluster is actually a, an open source project. It's an open source tool um, that, we, that is supported by AWS. You can find it on GitHub. You can install it via PIP, for example, with Python. And it will allow you to create clusters through a configuration file. In the case of Stability, uh, they actually created, um, so you have a head node from which you connect and submit your jobs, and they created this cluster with compute, their compute nodes, their shared file system, and so on. And everything is defined in this config file like a menu. If we take a deeper dive at, uh, at it, so they will, um, def you'll define the, what the head node, so that's actually where you'll connect. So I'm gonna SSH to my node and I'm gonna submit my computational jobs, in this case training. And then I'm gonna um, define the compute resources, which will be P4DEs, or it can be, for example, Trinium inst uh, instances. And I'll define that. I can even define multiple queues. And then you can define the storage like that. And you create, you, you will run one command using this YAML file as an input and say create. It will take a few minutes. In reality, if you were to actually build such cluster yourself, it will take probably a few months. But um, it, that's actually literally, you can deploy that. And uh, in fact, um, if you look at um, the stability um, GitHub called, um, I think, I believe that's stability HPC, you can actually uh, create a cluster identical to uh, what, um, what stability is using. So there are a few things that obviously they, uh, they have done on top of that. So they are working with a lot of different users coming from different uh, institutions and companies. And uh, authentication is important because you need to enable users to access, also control who's accessing what, understand also, you know, identify who's accessing what, um, which cursor, which resource. And they are using an authentication using um, um, so uh, AWS Active Directory, and it's connected directly to Parallel Cluster. 
So if they create a new cluster, that's fine. It's actually connected to Active Directory. Users can connect. There is no, no other access required, or let's say tuning required. And also, it, it allows them to keep track of jobs across regions and across, uh, across clusters, who's using what and when. Um, another um, important uh, property is that is of a parallel cluster and uh, of the cluster that Stability has built is that you can actually have multiple queues and multiple resources. For example, if you have um, um, a training workload that is using P4D, you can have your job running, and you can have a pre-processing workload that is running on another queue with another set of resources, for example, C6i, or, um, for example, an inference workload that can be executed on the inference shell or um, on the G5 instances. So you can have those different queues within the same cluster or even create multiple clusters for different teams. So that's also one of the properties for, um, um, that, that uh, the tool offers. And the way also Stability structured it is that they did some additional configuration. Uh, that's actually Richard Venku, um, who's um, the lead architect, um, lead HPC architect, if I'm not mistaken, for his title. Well, I guess yes. <laughs> so. Uh, is um, actually created a lot of um, packages, uh, scripts to, to configure the cluster. So some of the cluster, some of the scripts will be deployed cluster-wide, but you can also deploy cluster, uh, scripts either for the head node or for the compute node. For example, on the head node, you'll say, you know what, I'll need to actually add some configuration for Slurm. That's a batch scheduler, so the job scheduler. Um, I need to actually call an EC2 capacity reservation because I have actually a, uh, a reservation for this kind of instance. And uh, in the case of uh, the compute nodes, you will install, for example, GPU monitoring tools, which you don't need on the head node because it's, you know, it's using, it's a C5.9x uh, large, C, uh, it's a CPU node, but you actually do need that, for example, for, um, for the GPUs to monitor the utilization, to monitor as well, you know, of a, in, monitor in ERs, and there are some scripts that would be also specific again for the head node, for the compute node, and so on. And all that is actually executed at launch when you create the cluster. You can also uh, re-execute them during updates. Yes, you can update a, cl a cluster live. And um, then the users will actually install their own uh, packages, uh, their own, uh, their own uh, um, tools on top of that once the cluster has been created. But there is also one property that is important about this tool, is that uh, in the case of uh, stability, I was uh, actually talking to Richard and he told me, you know what, uh, Pierre, we have actually two queues. Uh, we, well, more than that, but we, we have actually two, two kind of queues. So we have the high priority queues, for example, for the training, and we have low priority um, uh, jobs, for example, you know, which can be for pre-processing, um, for example, to extract the embeddings of, on uh, the Lion data set. And uh, what happens is they are going to run those uh, low priority jobs, which typically less, uh, last less than 48 hours and can be interrupted. And then they are going um, to, they are going to actually, um, if, let's say a job is going to be, a big job is going to be executed, they are going to interrupt those jobs, requeue them automatically. In fact, it's managed directly by Slurm, so it's net, it's actually um, something that you can use yourself. And, um, then upon it, uh, once uh, the job, for example, the training job has been executed, then the prior, uh, low priority jobs will be recruited again, and then we can, they can be terminated if, not, if, um, if a new training job, higher priority job uh, happens as well. So we're about 93% utilization. 93% per percent, um, uh, utilization on, on, the, on the cluster. So I come from the on-prem uh, space um, in, in the Olinga space. Uh, in Olinga, the so utilization is about the same, but that's a very good rate of utilization. 93% is really high. Yeah, I think from the main supercomputers, it's usually about 8085. 8085, yeah, that's yeah. uh, correct. 8085 for the main supercomputers. And we're talking about national labs, uh, uh, a kind of supercomputers. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite an impressive um, um, uh, utilization rate. And uh, that's actually by managing aggressively the resources, not only obviously 
through uh, job, you know, job optimization, QoS, so quality of service, uh, that, can, that is actually baked in, uh, in, Slurm, uh, in Slurm, but also by monitoring the jobs. For example, by monitoring the GPUs. So if there is an error, they, they have actually, uh, they are using DCGMI. By the way, it's on GitHub. You can look at it uh, to uh, monitor, for example, is my GPU sane? For example, when I get an instance, do I have the right topology? Uh, do, um, do I have the right bandwidth as well? I'm gonna, before running a job, it's automated. But also to debug, for example, to collect some errors uh, in case there is a hint that we may have an issue on an instance. So then, they will actually discard it if an error is detected. Um, Richard actually automatically, through a script, will uh, uh, exclude, put the, the instance in an exclude list, and then actually automatically send a ticket. Through, uh, they are, you, you have Premier support, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to, to the EC2 teams. And there is also a, a utilization, um, so the, um, the team is also monitoring the utilization of their resources through two ways, so CloudWatch, as well as uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Actually, this one is the main. Uh, for GPU resource usage, as well as um, CPU, storage, uh, storage throughput, and so on. So it's really about you know, building not only a cluster that is accessible, but can also be monitored and optimized. Really to, um, and it's, I mean, the utilization rate is quite, quite impressive. And uh, you can access all these files. Um, so you can take a look at these uh, references. Um, Stability published their con cluster configuration as well as the different tools. It's uh, <coughs> quite complete uh, from what I can tell, and I highly recommend that you take a look at this. Without being said, the hands. I don't know <laughs> how to do that. Yeah, but so uh, earlier, earlier we talked about how the uh, kind of the Achilles heel of AI has been not being able to do hands and. This is from Stable Division 2, yeah. uh, Stable Division 2, right? So if you take a, a look at some of the more recent Reddit threads in Stable Diffusion, you'll actually see there's a ton of new hands being generated, and it's quite amazing. Um, so this was generated by Stable Diffusion 2. Um, Imad, I want to thank you for being up here. Pierre, thank you for doing this with us. Um, we have about eight minutes left, so we want to take some time to answer any questions that you have.